care throughout Greater New York that extends to the whole family. Learn more at calvaryhospital.org. If you believe democracy requires a free press, your station is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Marketplace is supported by Certified Financial Planner Professionals. Learn more about CFP Professionals at letsmakeaplan.org. On the program today, our usual Friday offering, What Happened This Week and Why. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by the United States Postal Service, offering postage stamps for purchase at more than 40,000 supermarkets, drugstores, office suppliers, and wholesale clubs. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdal. It is Friday today. This one is the 17th of May. Good as always to have you along, everybody. All right, so look, there was economic data this week that was mostly good. There was geopolitical news of this economy this week that was interesting. And there were various and sundry other items worth a mention, which we will do with Anna Swanson at the New York Times and Lynette Lopez, Lynette Lopez sorry, Lynette, at Business Insider. Hey, you too. Hey, guy. Uh, all right, Lynette, let me start with you after mangling your name. Um, inflation came in this week, the CPI at 3.4%, which was down just a touch and generally good. Retail sales were flat, also generally good. Do you take heart from this week in this economy? I, you know, we're not doing badly, <laughs> but it's still not great news. Um, and, you know, in the world of Wall Street and probabilities, no bad news is better than, like, no bad news. No bad news <laughs> is good news. And so you're everybody's getting super excited in the stock market again. Yeah, we're going to get to the market in a minute, but but uh, Anna, I want to I want to touch on the inflation number for a minute. We had mm -hmm. Austin Goolsbee from the Chicago Fed on this week, and and he and I went round and round a little bit on this use of the word bumpy. Janet Yellen used it with me last mm. week. Austin used it with me this week. Powell says it all the time that the road down to two percent on inflation is going to be bumpy. My question to Austin, which which he didn't really answer, was: Look, does bumpy mean you know, a little bump here and there, or is it one of those things where you hit the giant speed bump in your car and your teeth rattle? What's your sense of what bumpy actually means? Yeah, it's been a little more like um, the the teeth rattling yeah. uh, this year. I mean, so inflation readings last year kind of came down significantly. And then this year we had three solid months where inflation came in stronger than expected. And, and then one positive reading this month that things were moving in the right direction. So, you know, it was sort of like as if we were coming in for the landing and then the pain, plane took back up, back up again for like another big circle around the airport. So I think that, you know, this one positive reading, even though markets are pretty excited about it, um, the Fed obviously is going to want to see more evidence that we're on the right track. And I think they generally think that, you know, that higher interest rates will work. They just need to be patient but they're definitely uh, also on guard for other scenarios. Yeah. Uh, okay, Lynette, uh, the markets, Wall Street, uh, Anna mentioned it there for a second. You talked about it uh, a minute ago. Here's what I want to know. Why does Wall Street so badly want a rate cut, and why do they take such great heart uh, every time there's, a, there's a, an indicator that says, yeah, you know, rate cuts might be coming sooner rather than later? What's the deal? Rate cuts are the sign that we are getting to this soft like the sooner we get a rate cut the sooner the fed is confident that inflation is going away and if we don't have a hard landing before that happens like the economy doesn't slow down significantly and we already get to the rate cuts that means the landing is going to be softer and it might not create an interruption in corporate earnings or like we won't see a major fall in retail sales. Basically, it all means that the probability of the economy having a soft landing is greater than if we just keep rates higher for longer. That means the possibility of a hard landing is still on the table. Okay. Let me, let me stick with you, Lynette, actually, because you're closer to the markets than Anna is. And Anna, I got a bunch of China stuff that I want to talk to you about in a second. <laughs> but but look, has Wall Street gotten greedy, Lynette, do you think? Gotten? Come on, 
That's so funny. Come as on, soon as guys. the word was out of my mouth, I was like, she's going to jump on me for that one. Uh, gotten greedy. No, there is no bottomless pit to the greed. There is never enough good news. There is never enough. There are never more earnings. Dow to the moon, 5,000. No. Mm-hmm. What, what Wall Street wants is a market that doesn't necessarily change very much. You know, yeah. when you keep interest rates at a higher rate, decisions that are made by companies and by individuals change. And that changes the shape of the economy. It changes mm-hmm. how Wall Street has to think about their investment portfolios. It creates volatility and more work for all these dudes who just want to spend the summer in the Hamptons. <laughs> Fair, fair point. Okay. Anna Swanson, uh, who's covered China extensively, lived and worked there. International trade is your thing. Um, uh, talk to me, first of all, about the Biden announcement on tariffs this week. He's not only officially blessing the Trump era tariffs, but adding more of his own on mm-hmm. EVs and solar cells and those uh, sorts of things. Um, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, I I felt like the most notable part about it for me was what Biden did not do. So he didn't roll back any of the tariffs Mm -hmm. that uh, that Trump had imposed, including on consumer products. And that's something that um, Biden officials had discussed for a long time, you know, easing some of the tariffs that that hit consumers particularly hard. Apparently, they didn't feel like they wanted to give concessions to China. You know, they feel like Chinese trade practices have not improved. But they also apparently didn't feel like they wanted to give, you know, concessions and relief to American consumers, Mm -hmm. you know, who are what, um, you know, the the people who economists say pay for most of the tariffs. And so I think that for me is just a sign of how much opinion has swung um, toward, you know, putting more importance on domestic manufacturing than, than consumers and how much tariffs and trade protections are kind of the new normal now. Right. And, and left unsaid is the political impact of this stuff, right? Which is very real in this, in this season. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the news uh, out of China this morning about them coming to the rescue in essence of their much, much troubled property sector. That is a mm. very big deal, right? That's been a huge drag on that economy. It has. Yeah. Yeah. And there's um, there's a huge and kind of very slow moving uh, problem there. Um, And, you know, the China knows that it needs to switch away from its reliance on investment to power its economy that, um, you know, high speed trains and new apartment Mm. buildings are great, but China has a lot of those. Um, But in the interim, you know, it's also even relying more on exports to power growth uh, than it has. And so that also brings it more into tension with countries like the United States and leads to these issues with tariffs that we were just talking about. Right. And that is the overcapacity thing that that Secretary Yellen's been talking about for a while. That's Anna Swanson uh, at The New York Times and Lynette Lopez at, uh, God, I messed up your name both sides. Lynette Lopez. I'm so, I'm really sorry. (laughs) At business. I've only been doing this for a decade. I I know. I'm just going to get out of here now. You guys have a great weekend. All right. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Bye. Coming up. We've been able to happily provide our team members a livable wage, which is something that we're excited about. Exciting for the team members, too, I bet. First, though, let's do the numbers. Dow Industrials up 134 on this Friday, three tenths percent, closed at 40,003 by the hair on its chinny chin chin. The NASDAQ ticked down 12 points, about a tenth percent, 16,685. The SP 500 up five points, about a tenth percent. 5303 there. For the five days gone by, the Dow picked up one and a quarter percent. The Nasdaq added two and a tenth percent. The S&P 500 elevated itself one and a half percent. Justin Ho is telling us about small business credit card spending, so let's look at some of the big card companies, shall we? Visa charged up a tenth percent. Capital One pocketed about a half percent. J.P. Morgan Chase, the credit card company, big bank, rose one and a tenth percent today. Bond prices went down. That means the yield went up. Benchmark 10-year T-notes increased to 4.42% on the yield. You're listening to Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Progressive Insurance, providing direct car insurance rates side-by-side with other insurance carriers. Customers can see rates and find an option that works for their needs. Now that's Progressive. Learn more at Progressive.com. And by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to raising awareness and accelerating action on America's fiscal challenges to build a brighter economic future for the next generation. Learn more at pgpf.org.
WNYC is independent public radio free to all, but it's not free to operate. For-profit media can raise subscription fees and put important news behind a paywall, but WNYC doesn't have fees or paywalls. We rely on something more powerful, you. You come to WNYC for the news and stories you value, and because you value it, you choose to support it. If you're not a member yet, now is the time to join. And if you're already a member, thank you. Please consider increasing your gift to help us meet our rising costs. Help us deliver commercial-free, nonprofit public radio to all of New York. Here's how. Call 888-376-9692. You can also go online to WNYC.org and click on Donate. We have a goal for this pledge drive to get 10,000 individual contributions by the end of the pledge drive. Whatever amount works for you works for us. We're not asking you to give a certain amount or give in a certain frequency. We're asking that you do give. If you haven't given before, fantastic. That is great. Welcome to the club. We appreciate you being here. We're glad that you're part of it. If you've already given before or maybe you're already a monthly, sust- a monthly sustainer, think about upping that a, a couple of dollars a month. Uh, we have rising costs, so we hope that um, your contribution is commensurate with that amount of rising cost. Either way, Anyway, whatever, whatever, whatever background you're coming from here, we want you to contribute. Be part of that 10,000. 888-376-9692 or WNYC.org. Yeah, as Sean says, it really doesn't matter what you give. It matters that you give. It is really important that our listeners, as many of our listeners as possible, donate something to keep WNYC strong. It is a vote of confidence in our mission. It is a way of saying, I really believe in listener-supported public media, and I want to keep you strong through the coming years because I know of the challenges we are facing. I know we have the election coming up. I know the first thing I thought this, Sean, when I heard that there was going to be a debate between President Biden and former President Trump, my first thought was, oh, I can't wait to hear what the Brian Lehrer show the mm-hmm. next day is going to sound like because mm-hmm. I want to, I want to get that analysis, but I also want to hear my community reacting to it in a way that is like thoughtful and not just people screaming at each other. We can have tough conversations here on WNYC because we have your confidence and you trust us to bring you through those times. We cannot do it without you. And right now, if you donate in the next 18 minutes, your donation is doubled. We have a matching gift from the Kaplan Brothers Foundation. Every dollar you give is doubled. If you give $10 a month, it becomes $20 a month. It's amazing. It's a great opportunity. If you've never donated, now is the time. 888-376-9692 or go online at WNYC.org. If you believe fearless, independent journalism is essential to our democracy, and if you think intelligent, measured conversation about important issues strengthens our community, well then, we ask that you become a sustaining member of WNYC right now. If it's in your means, you can join us at the $100 a month level. You'll become a member of the Producers Circle. You'll be entered into all the contests, receive a station tour, and be invited to other events. But more importantly, You'll not only pay for the shows you listen to, you'll also help those who may not be able to contribute. So, if WNYC adds value to your life and you're in a position to give $100 a month to ensure this important community resource can be there for all of us, please do it right now. Here's how. Call 888-376-9692. You can also go online to WNYC.org. Know that if you do join the producer circle at that $100 a month level, $1,200 one-time contribution, that it is doubled. But you have to make it in the next 17 minutes because that matching period ends at 7 p.m. So please run to the phone right now. Pick it up. Contribute what you can. We hope you join the producer circle, but really give it whatever works for you. 888-376-9692. Your contribution is doubled right now until 7 p.m. You can make it to at WNYC.org. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. As we have mentioned, well, you know, a lot this week and also today specifically, the latest batch of inflation data has been promising. Prices are still going up, but the rate at which that is happening has slowed. Disinflation is the word you're looking for. Another way to think about it, inflation that is, came from the Congressional Budget Office this week. Purchasing power, how much your dollar gets you. The CBO says that if you look at the same basket of goods from the before times to 2023, on average, Americans need less of their income to buy the same set of stuff. Now, if that feels just a bit off to you, 
I get it. Marketplace's Kimberly Adams looks at why that is. According to the Congressional Budget Office, purchasing power went up across all income groups because incomes grew faster than prices between 2019 and 2023. That kind of goes against the common perception of what's going on is that people are losing purchasing power over the last few years. Vance Ginn is president of Ginn Economic Consulting and was a White House chief economist during the Trump administration. The CBO found, percentage-wise, that folks in the highest income bracket spent less of their income on common expenses, down 6.3 percent. Thank you, stock market. Folks in the lower income brackets weren't so lucky. They saw only a 2% drop in how much they spent on basics, thanks to higher wages. But for people in the middle, it was even less noticeable. And that's why I think they've been kind of not being able to be as, as prosperous as some of the others during this period. Plus, these numbers reflect averages, not people's individual experiences. And that's where narratives really come into play especially in an election year. Michael Linden is a senior policy fellow at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. We did go through a period of about 18 months of very elevated inflation, but it's also true that prices today are uh, rising roughly in line with previous historical experience. And in campaign ads and stump speeches, we'll probably end up hearing versions of both inflation stories, amplified in whichever direction benefits the candidate talking. And I think that the American people are going to have to decide uh, when they hear about inflation, which of those two things is more important to them. And whose narrative about the economy you choose to believe. In Washington, I'm Kimberly Adams for Marketplace. All right, one has five digits, starting with the number four as of today. It's got 30 component parts and is, to be completely clear, not the economy. If you said the Dow Jones Industrial Average, go straight to the head of the class. The blue chips closed above 40K for the first time today. Again, not the economy, but it can tell us something about how people feel about this economy. Marketplace's Kristen Schwab takes it from there. Okay, so if the stock market is not the economy, then what is it? The stock market is approximately the market's expectation of the publicly traded firms within our economy. Kelly Hsu is a finance professor at Yale. She says the Dow's performance means traders think the outlook for companies is good, or at least less risky. And sometimes, yes, that means the outlook for the economy is less risky, too. Here's how Ryan Dietrich, chief market strategist at Carson Group, explains the Dow and the economy. They rhyme. They're cousins. Related. Traders are happy about the slowing inflation numbers and advancements in AI. But the stock market and the economy can also have about as much in common as you have with your second cousin twice removed. Like back in May of 2020, we were living in a pre-vaccine pandemic. Unemployment was over 13 percent. Meanwhile, markets were climbing. So let's regroup for a second. Why then do we care about the Dow hitting 40,000? Here's Dietrich again. Listen, it's not honestly all that different than 39,999 technically, but it is a psychological level. Psychological because it's a nice round number. Psychological because the Dow is a decent indicator of how the markets are doing in general. Jim Angel is a finance professor at Georgetown. When I turn on Marketplace and I hear, oh, the Dow has gone up 1%, most other stocks have probably gone up somewhere in that vicinity. So what does all this mean for you? Well, if you're not invested, nothing. And if you are, the Dow's performance itself still might not matter unless you own some pricey stocks. Just 30 legacy companies like Microsoft and United Healthcare make up the Dow. Is the granddaddy of all stock indices. And just a slice of the market. I'm Kristen Schwab for Marketplace. There is a tendency in business and economic reportage, present company included, to dwell a lot, perhaps too much, on the consumer. How much we're spending, how we're feeling, what we're buying or not buying. But we forget businesses in that equation at our peril, how they are feeling, what investments they are making, and how they are spending their money. 
American Express said the other day in its earnings call that business spending has been kind of slow and spending on its business credit cards by small and mid-sized businesses in particular was up just 1% compared to the same time a year ago. As Marketplace's Justin Ho reports, the competition for that slot in business owners' wallets where their credit cards go has been heating up. Business credit cards work basically the same way as the ones you probably have in your wallet. You use them to buy things, rack up a balance, hopefully pay it off. That's what businesses do, too. Some of them a lot more than others. Sometimes the credit card spend is going, you know, upwards of $800,000 a month. That's Jeff Cayley, the owner of Worldwide Cyclery, a mountain bike store in Newbury Park, California. He says he'll charge anything he possibly can to his store's Capital One credit card. Inventory, travel expenses, the internet bill, snacks for the lounge. That's because the card offers a little incentive. They give us 2% cash back unlimited on all purchases. And I have not found anything that's ever beat that. For a consumer, 2% cash back might mean a few bucks here and there. But for Worldwide Cyclery, one month of spending might return upwards of $10,000. Kaylee says that can really take the edge off of the company's expenses. When you're operating a business, you're looking at your profit and loss statement sort of religiously. And if we can get some cash back on that credit card spend, that can go straight to the bottom line of the business, which is really helpful. One reason Capital One can give him some cash back is that every time he buys new tires or spokes or suspension forks from one of his merchants, the merchant pays a fee in order to accept credit card transactions. That's Tony DeSanctis, senior director at the consulting company Cornerstone Advisors. He says credit card companies earn more of those fees from people doing their everyday shopping than they do from small businesses because there are just a lot more consumer credit cards out there. Everybody who wants a credit card from a consumer perspective probably has one or maybe four, right? As opposed to in the small business space, less than half of small businesses are actually using credit cards on a regular basis. And so credit card companies have leaned in to trying to win over the half that don't. Here at Once Upon a Farm, we chose the Capital One Venture X business card. When you start small, you need some big help, and Chase Inc. was that for me. The Amex Business Gold Card. Gotta get out, gotta get out. With flexible spending capacity that adapts with your business. While credit card companies have been advertising to small businesses on TV, their target market has been growing. Last year, the number of applications to start a new business hit a record, according to the Census Bureau. So that in itself creates an opportunity. That's Andrew Davidson. He follows credit card marketing at the research company Compare Media. He says it's not just banks that have been piling into the space with new products. Smaller fintech companies have been too. Some of them offer services like help with taxes or accounting. Davidson says business credit cards have also been getting more specialized products targeting like influencers for example there's a company that's launched a small business card just for content creators there's a card targeting small business owners that are needing to build up their credit history the success of any of these cards will depend on whether business owners like marcia st hilaire finn feel comfortable using them she owns bright start early care and preschool in washington dc and she's dialed back spending on her american express business card because enrollment has stalled and the cost of supplies is still rising we only buy must-haves. We don't buy like want to have or love to have items. So we'll just cover what we need to provide our services. St. Hilaire Finn is hoping that by later this year, she'll be able to start spending on want-to-haves and at least one love-to-have, one of those machines that makes foam for foam parties. That would be really fun. And I'm like, we're going to get it, but we're like, just not right now. <laughs> St. Hilaire Finn says she's expecting her enrollment and her spending to pick up when the next school year starts this fall. I'm Justin Howe for Marketplace. This final note on the way out today in which GameStop maybe got a little bit greedy. You've heard of the new new meme stock thing, right? A return version of the frenzy around a couple of stocks that happened back in 2021, of which GameStop was first among equals. Anyway, GameStop shares, ticker symbol GME, if you're playing along at home, had a better than 200% bump last Friday to midweek this week. Then the company said, oh, hey, we're going to sell 45 million new shares. And GME lost 20% just like that. Are they still up, those shares? Yes, they are. Is this the greater fool theory made real? Yes, it is. Our theme music was composed by B.J. Lederman, Marketplace's executive producer is Nancy Fargali. 
Donna Tam is the executive editor. Neil Scarborough is vice president and general manager. I'm Kai Rizal. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you again on Monday, all right? This is APM.